In this section of the course, we'll look more closely at how biological variation BV data can be used to set total allowable error TEA targets. Upon completion of this section, you'll be able to define total allowable error TEA, total error TE, and z-score. List reasons why it's beneficial to use a secondary feedback mechanism like TEA. Explain how total error and total allowable error are used to determine if patient test results are reliable. Calculate total error, total allowable error, imprecision, actual and performance goal, and bias, actual and performance goal. List the methods used to obtain the imprecision for a test. Describe the difference between the three performance goals of minimum, desirable, and optimum. Determine if published biological variation data exists for a test. Compare actual values for imprecision and bias to selected goals to help identify where reasoned troubleshooting is needed. Total Allowable Error TEA is an analytical quality specification that sets limits for imprecision and bias that are acceptable in a single test result. It's a process control tool based on human biological variation data and can be used as a secondary feedback mechanism for statistical process control SPC analysis. Why use a secondary feedback mechanism? For several reasons. Lack of quality planning. Lack of working knowledge of SPC rules. Misapplication of SPC rules. Desensitization to error flags. As stated in this CLSI standard, the first step to planning an effective quality control procedure is to define the intended quality for a test. While laboratories will devote time ensuring a new instrument, kit, or method meets manufacturer claims, many do not plan for how much imprecision and bias is acceptable for a test. Consequently, such laboratories often set process control rules that intuitively may seem appropriate or reflect past experience but inherently discount the technical aspects of the test that directly relate to analytical quality. Technologists are often not aware of the statistical power of each SPC rule when applied singly or in combination, multi-rule. Often, they're also not aware that some rules identify error due to imprecision and others identify errors due to bias. Lack of a working knowledge of the SPC rules can lead to misapplication and an increase in false error flags. This results in rejection of credible patient test results that are appropriate for clinical decision making. Regardless of the analytical capabilities of a test, some laboratories will continue to use only a 1-2-S rule as a rejection limit. According to Dr. Westgard, failure to allow for valid points between 2SD and 3SD may result in falsely rejecting 5% of analytical runs when using one level of control. 10% of analytical runs when using two levels of control. 14% of analytical runs when using three levels of control. Another effect of using the 1-2-S rule indiscriminately is the narrowing of the standard deviation over time and therefore range on the Levy-Jennings chart. This is because rejected data is not used to calculate the cumulative mean, thereby skewing the mean and standard deviation. The consequence of a narrowing standard deviation over time on the Levy-Jennings chart is the increase in frequency of false error detections and unnecessary rejections. Another practice is the application of the same single rule or multi-rule to all tests 
regardless of instrument or method. This is done because it makes QC easier to manage. However, with the rules not reflecting test performance in relation to stability, sensitivity, and specificity along the method curve, unnecessary error flags, run rejections, recalibrations, and repeat testing is caused. For all of your laboratory QC needs, go to www.qcnet.com.